as we talk about the All Black side, also 1A. Jamie, the most independent, trustworthy voice in New Zealand sports journalism, about to catch the big bird, not to Japan, but you're on the Northern Tour, but the, the 23 has been named. All right. The big talking point, obviously, at number 12. Here was me saying minutes ago that I didn't think Roger would start a game on this tour. Well, what would I know? He starts at 12. Yeah, hey, Marty. Uh, yeah, interesting-looking team. Uh, it was always going to be an, an interesting one, wasn't it? Um, uh, I'm not that surprised to see Roger there. Uh, also not that surprised to see Stephen Perifetta there as well. Um, that was pretty much signalled uh, from a while back by Ian Foster. And so, I mean... If nothing else, by the end of this game, we're going to know whether those two uh, all-black long-term prospects, um, well, hopefully, <laughs> I think. Well, OK, what does it say about, you know, the, the Rogers situation? Because, Jamie, we know, and we can be honest about this without disrespecting the player, he is not the best number 12 in the country. He wouldn't even be amongst, I don't believe, the five or six best midfield backs. So what is this telling us? Well, it's telling us that they want to see a bit of a, uh, an ROI on their um, on getting him over from from league because uh, you know it's not an ins- insignificant amount that he's getting paid because uh, you know he was on a pretty good deal at the Warriors um, and and NZ Rugby would have had to have kind of gone some way to matching that and so it's about time that they they started to see something uh, out of what they've what they've paid for and this was always going to be a game where he was, you know, you could have said this at the start of the season, before all the dramas happened, before, you know, before it even played Super Rugby, really. Like, as soon as this, this game got marked down, it was like, OK, this is the one where Roger Tuvo yeah. uh, Sheik is, is going to play, play a role, uh, and a prominent role at that. Well, OK, so we were discussing a little earlier. People, if you've just joined us, the All Black team to play Japan has been announced. Was he rushed into that Ireland squad too early? We've had Alama Itamiya on the programme saying that he needed game time. We've had so many other commentators, calls, contributors, yours as well, just saying, look, you know, we haven't seen enough. Then he gets put on the wing for the MPC and we get this confusion around, oh, it's better for him if he plays as many different positions as possible, which I just think is a nonsense. Rugby is so complicated these days. Playing wing and playing midfield back, it's just like playing two different sports, isn't it? So, you know... uh, what what are we meant to, what are we meant to believe? Are we meant to believe that he's been given an opportunity because we want him to be that good, or we think he can be that good, or is he being given an opportunity because maybe you know with the attrition rate amongst midfield backs as well, mate? And then we see them go down, don't we? We see them we lose tend to lose so many of them that we have to give this guy game time. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I mean you also look at the guy outside him as well, like Braden Eno. I mean he's barely playing in rugby. The, of late either uh, so to put out this sort of midfield um, against uh, a Japanese team that's obviously playing at home and has had quite an interesting build up um, to this one and has a, a coaching staff that is more than motivated to make a point um, against the, an, an all black team um, is kind of rolling the dice a, a little bit uh, I personally thought they would have you know, perhaps put Anton Leonard Brown straight back into the starting team um, you know, he's been out injured, but he still kind of has that experience. You kind of want in your midfield to at least, if, if you're going to have one rookie, you want one old head next to him. I mean, Eno's been around, but like I said, he uh, I'd be struggling to remember the amount of games that he's actually played um, this season. So that, that's going to be quite an interesting uh, uh, area of the field to be watching because... You know, not just on. We know what these guys can do on attack, but how they how they communicate and the cohesion on defence is going to be uh, quite uh, qu- quite an interesting thing. Because, like honestly, if I was Jamie Joseph and Tony Brown, I'd be saying, "Boys, we're running it running into those guys like all day." Yeah. Well, you think so? Look, okay, I just did a quick calculation here. You got a backline of Finley Christie, Mwanga, Tuivasa, Sheik, Enor. You've got Reese and Caleb on the wings, and you've got Peter Fetter uh, playing fullback. They've got Peter Fitter down as one test. I mean, he played, what, 30 seconds of that test. Hmm. Braden Enor has played five tests. Two of us are Sheik, they've said, uh, down for two tests. I mean, he hasn't started a test. When you look at that back line, if you take out Richie Mawang, they played 52 tests between them. If you take out Sever Reese, the rest have played a combined 31 between them. That is a novice all-black back line regardless. Don't know how else well you can paint it. Yeah, absolutely right. And, and it reminds me of the last time the all-blacks played a test against Japan in Japan, where if you remember that 2018 game where they named, I think it was eight debutants, and if you took Dane Coles the in, out, the entire team 
had less than 100 caps uh, in it. So, I mean, this this feels very very similar. It's not quite the same because it's not as they haven't they're not rolling out like a whole bunch of new guys because they're obviously all in the All Blacks 15 um, team. Uh, but I don't know if this All Black team has really been playing well enough this year to really justify, uh, you know, doing something experimental like this. Like this this is a bit of an ambush um, coming up. Like out of all the games on this tour this is probably the most interesting one because it'll say a lot about where the All Blacks are, um, but it'll also say a lot about where Japan is because, you know, they're, they're not bad anymore. It's not 145-17 with these guys no, no. Uh, anymore. You know, they've, they're, 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 and they, they have the staff. And like I said before, that's a, that's a motivated couple of guys because I feel like, you know, in, in about a year and a half's time, we're going to be talking about Jamie Joseph and Tony Brown and the all-black coaching setup. Yeah, and, and should have been. Next should have been, because both of those guys apparently were named by Ian Foster originally, but it was stuffed around by New Zealand rugby. They've learned from the stuff around, though. They don't make that many more mistakes anymore, do they? No, not at all. No, no. It's uh, And it's, um, it, you know, been a, a couple of, apart from a rare misstep um, this week, you know, can't speak highly enough of them. All right, so what we're looking at is, well, we had Jamie Joseph on the program about an hour ago, mate, and what he was saying to us is he was saying that, you know, and whether or not he's just, eh, he's just painting his own picture here, but he was saying that Japanese rugby is actually in the most parlous state it's been in years. He said it's weak. He said we haven't had the competition because of COVID and so forth. Then the Sunwolves go out, and he said our players just don't get the games, and he said it's actually really difficult for us to get up to speed. You know, they're playing Tier 1 nations. I think they get South Africa after this in England. Uh, they've played France twice. He said five Tier 1 tests in a year. You know, we just don't. And he just said, we don't have the, the build-up. We don't have the cattle at the moment. But I'm looking at it from an all-black perspective and going, hang on a second. So we're now going to play Wales. And, and this team here that has been named, Aaron Smith's on the bench, sure. Papali'i. I'm looking at perhaps Patrick Tui Paluto. I'm looking, there's a few names there that you know are going to appear against Wales. But, Jamie, most of the side is not running on against Wales. Not, most of them aren't part of the 23. So that team that plays against Wales is going to be a side that hasn't played any rugby for how long? Five, six, eight weeks? Yeah, absolutely, and and I mean th- this is the issue that uh, we've had throughout um, throughout the season is that you've got a lot of guys who are spending a lot of their time in the All Blacks um, watching, um, and Roger Vasasek's one of them. And you know, ever since the end of the Rugby Championship, you've had the bulk of the most experienced, you know, better players in the squad um, sitting around doing nothing. They, you know, I, I'm not saying they should have played in the NPC, but there was definitely, you know. Uh, opportunities there to kind of get them, get them, get them up to speed and get them throwing a ball around. But you're right; like it's been a, it's been a while since this All Black team has, uh, you know, faced cons- consecutive tests. And if you look back to the start of the Rugby Championship um, with that game in Nelsbrook, um they weren't they once they'd had a break after the Irish series. It's not like they came back in no. uh, looking that looking that fantastic. So I think that that's, that's something that the coaching staff will really have to kind of uh, keep an eye on and get this team motivated. I mean, they should be anyway because, you know, they're the All Blacks. But at the same time, you know, you've got, like you mentioned, this is one start to, the, to this tour and then you're going to have another start next week because, like you said, it's an entirely di- going to be an entirely different team. Um, we're going to play you some of that, Jamie Joseph, in just a second, mate. We'll just recycle that for you. All right, so there it is, people. I'll go through the team again. For I don't probably have to. You can just jump on a website and have a look. But uh, Enor comes back in. Trevor Sarshet comes back in. Peter Feta. I mean, that's good that he gets his debut. I was hoping that that would happen because it must... I mean, even though he'd never say it, it must be a bit of a sour taste that you were brought on for 30 seconds of a game that was already lost. And so it's great to see that he gets it. Um, but as, you know, the rest of them, I'm sitting there thinking, OK, there's a lot of names there that aren't first choice select names. Sam Kane comes back as well. It'll be valuable to see him and Retallick are two of the names, obviously, that start that are going to be playing. Let's go on to the 1A First 15 thing. I know that you're busy. You've got to fly out tomorrow yourself to the UK. Uh, this statement that came out from all the school principals, look, when you read it, it looks on the surface. It's something that you got. You think, oh, wow, congratulations. You've done the right thing. It, but when you actually look a little deep, more deeper into it, I, I just can't help but be cynical about this going, it's a little too late, isn't it, now to say that, OK, no TV coverage is going to actually impact in a way that they want it to impact or actually do anything that's actually going to manifestly and magnificently change the fact that these first 15 athletes are under the microscope scrutiny and are getting a hell of a lot of extra publicity they probably don't want. Or maybe they do want. Well, let's just look at the the system that, that's in place. You know, you have 
um, a young kid, um, perhaps coming out of primary school or intermediate, um, who has been, you know, quite a good young rugby player. Um, he might be living in a in a part of, let's say, Auckland that you know it doesn't have access to the greatest uh, public school system, but he's noticed, you know, he's he's, he's noticed by another school, and, and they come along and they and they offer him a scholarship. And you know, and and for people living in uh, Rimuera or on uh, over in Devonport, you know, it's probably like, hey, mate, you know, your education is more important. You don't have to go move over to another school. But for someone living down Otara, you know, Papakura, for that family, it's seen as a bit of a lifeline. It's like, wow, this is something. This is a massive opportunity for our son. Let's go do this. So they go after the school. Um, they get special treatment because they're a, they're a young rugby player. They're, they're held up as um, you know fine examples of what the school is all about. There's pressure put on them. Um, there's pressure to perform. There's pressure to train. Uh, there's you know there's all this expectation that they're there to play rugby um, and and to win games um, for the school. And then they make the first fifteen. And they have agents probably coming after them. They have talk about, you know, where their pathway is going to take them to play Super Rugby or the All Blacks or the NRL or, or anything. Their head's full, filled with all these ideas. And then they get to play on TV. And these principals are trying to tell us that the last stage in that process, if we take that away, is going to magically fix everything. Yeah, right. It's not. No. It's not going to fix it. It's not going to fix it at all. And I feel like it's a massive amount of hypocrisy from them because they've created the system. They've created it. They've let it. They've 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 let they it happen. They promoted it, it actively, benefits, mate. It, it benefits benefits their schools. Yeah. And I think that you know these these the people making the decision aren't fooling anyone for a start, and that unless they're going to institute some sort of code of conduct, some sort of um, funding cap on on what what gets spent on on school rugby because as soon as you start talking about money and uh, that's involved with these schools, um, all of a sudden the conversation just gets a little bit more like, do you really have these kids' best interests at heart? Do you? Because I think that you know if you're spending millions of dollars on a first fifteen, then I don't think you do. No, I, I really don't. And you know. For them, like I said, for them to come out and suggest, put the blame on the likes of Sky TV or, or whoever is live streaming the competitions around the country um, is ludicrous, absolutely ludicrous. And um, I think that uh, it just kind of shows what sort of hypocrites are running these schools or, or business entities um, that they, they probably see themselves as. Um, for what they really are. Finally, do you honestly think that these school principals always are going around with the cane like in the old days, like when you were at school and I was at school, and every single person with a cell phone in the ground is going to have their phone confiscated? Because every person there is filming that game, mate, or bits of that game, aren't they? Or filming their mate playing, aren't they? And they're putting it on social media. You can't stop the yeah. train. It's already left the station, people. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's, that's another stupid thing about it. It's, it's like you don't want... Uh, if you think you're going to stop um, kids talking about uh, rugby, um, filming highlights uh, and, and, and putting um, coverage of, of your school in a way that you might not be okay with out there, then you're dreaming. You're absolutely dreaming. Um, and this is not going to stop it at all. Fly well. We'll be back in touch when they're in the UK. I know that you've got a little kid to put on the plane as well. And just use that as the terrorism it is. And because I always used to think when I didn't have children, I hated kids on planes. As soon as I got them, I just said, do what you want. Take the sticky stuff, <laughs> smear it over there. Spew on that whatever you want, mate. Okay? You can demand one of those seats up the front with the big fold-out thing. You get extra leg room. Take advantage, Jamie. I will, mate. Thanks for the advice. I mean, once the, once the, once the door's shut, he can't go anywhere. That's so it. you might as well let him run Just let him run, run loose, mate. Bolt. Let him run loose, yeah. you know? Yeah. Have fun. We'll talk to him in a week or so, eh? Thanks, mate. Cheers, mate. Always appreciate it. Jamie Wall with us.